And this week's episode of Student Inter, we'll be talking about the amazing win in the Derby della Madonnina against AC Milan, together with Serie A commentator Marco Palmieri. We'll be previewing the matches against Lazio and Napoli, this week's Moratti, Moji and Frog, and much, much more. Everything here on Studio Inter, only on sempreinter.com. <laughs> Recupera Brazovic, andiamo in contropiede, la porta è vuota, tira, attenzione, e gol, e gol! Benvenuti, bentornati to another edition of Studio Inter. I'm your host, Nima Tavalli Ruzzari, who's floating on air, walking on sunshine, whatever you want to do, like I think most Interisti are doing right now, and... As this is a, as that was an absolutely crazy and special game, we've got a very special episode. Um, it's going to be a little bit different. People, I, I, I really wanted as many people to, on the show today as possible. So, uh, as and, and I'm so grateful that so many have accepted. So, th- people are going to be coming and going in a little bit um, throughout the show. But let me start with uh, the uh, excellent preview writer uh, at SimpleInter.com, Mr. Mohammed Nasa. How you doing, Mo? Posit- Mr. Positivity, I think everyone's Mr. Positivity today. I, <laughs> I guess, yeah, I mean, we all, we all got to be positive today. What a, what a fantastic morning, what a fantastic night last night. Couldn't be better. Yeah, great to Amen. be here. Amen. And we are also joined by our good friend, uh, he's a Serie A commentator uh, down in, uh, uh, in, in, Milan, in Milan, and he was at the game yesterday, Mr. Marco Palmieri. Good evening. Good evening, uh, everybody. Nima Mo, how you doing? Um, we're doing good. How? How? We're, I'm going to talk to you soon, so I can I can only imagine what a game it was yesterday. Um, and um, I was being there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll I'll get to it soon. <laughs> <laughs> and our very good friend, Mr. Fulvio Santucci, who lives in Milan, but I forgot to ask him if he's if he was at the game yesterday. But I I think you were commentating it. What were you doing? Yeah, exactly, Nima. Hello, everyone. It's good to be here. We made the system yesterday and I made it uh, commentating actually, but uh, I was not at the, at the stadium, but uh, I think that's, it, it, this was a derby that we're going to remember for like a decade or something like that. Oh, for sure, for sure, for sure. Um, right, and we're also joined by our good friend all the way from Miami, Mr. Alex Dono. What a great day. What a beautiful world we're living in. I just, I, I, I'm in such a positive <laughs> mood. This must be what it feels like to be Mo every single day. <laughs> exactly. Mo mood. Um, right. And we're also... <laughs> it, it, this is, this is, this is, this must what it will be like what it feels to be you, Alex. You live in Florida. You've got sunshine every day. That is true. Uh, a little too hot for my taste in the summers, but this is the time of year I will take it. <laughs> and we're also, speaking of weather, uh, we have a friend, a very good friend from TSN, uh, Michael Gallo in Toronto. And I know, I suspect that despite the weather, you're, you're, you're shining like a sun. <laughs> I woke up this morning, the sun was shining, there was birds chirping, <laughs> the grass was growing. Well, maybe not the grass, because we did have some snow last night, but I will say everything is great, everything is fine, and this is a great day to be an Interista. It is a, it is a good day to be an Inter fan. That game was absolutely insane, and it was one of those games that, uh, I mean, on this show the past few years, I've complained a little bit about how the Derby de la Madonina has not been the incredible game it's been in terms of quality and spectacle and whatnot. But yesterday, I'm so glad that the whole world was watching because it was absolutely, it, it was, I mean, talk about, a, talk about a good advertisement for Italian football. I mean, what do you want? Uh, that, the, the, the San Siro almost f- flew off into space yesterday. Um, I wanted to ask you, Marco, you were there. I mean, uh, what, what are your, I mean, honestly, when, when the way that Milan came out and dominated that first half, did, was, the, I mean, was there anything in your mind that suggested that Inter could come back? Not only, I mean, even get a draw, not let alone win. Yeah, it was uh, it was pretty incredible. I've got to say, I don't think anybody expected um, um, Inter to have pretty much their worst ever half of football the whole season uh, in a match that was just so big, so much expectation, so much riding on it. Of course, the the, the loss to Juventus the night before made it even more important and. Yeah, I don't think 
um, anyone expected Milan to dominate so much in that first half. It was uh, quite a spectacle. And um, yeah, Inter just were all over the shop. And then Padelli in goal also didn't help things. Um, <laughs> I, I got to say, I mean, it's it, it's a shame someone who hasn't played any football in you know over two years or whatever it is, and then all of a sudden has to get thrown into such a massive match. It just it didn't look really calm and you know, under control, and um, and it showed. <clears throat> but I mean, that atmosphere. I mean, you were there at the game. I mean, just watching it. I mean, for those of us who who've been blessed enough to be able to to be able to to attend the Milan derby, it it is unlike anything else in the world. But I think yesterday was something special. Was that yeah. how you were feeling you being there? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, it um, it was great to have a lot of, um, shall we say, uh, perspectives from different people because I've got to say the big matches, or not even the big matches uh, lately, um, quite pretty much every match at the San Siro nowadays is has got a great um, atmosphere. But the influx of overseas visitors to Milan for the matches themselves has just taken over you know it, it has really grown leaps and bounds it's incredible how many people come just for the match so i was out on saturday night and i ran into countless number of um, play uh, people from the uk from germany from all over eastern europe all here for watching to watch the the melan derby and and so it, it it's great to have that to share with the rest of the world and mm. and you get you know, you get kind of these uh, perspectives and opinions of people and and you kind of hope that um, it's going to be a decent event. Like oh, I've, I've taken a few people to, to watch football um, over the years that I've been here. And, and, you know, there's always that risk that, oh, you know, nil, nil draw and, uh, you know, just um, defensive minded, not much, especially for people that don't really know football. But but um, OK, when you go to the derby, you're pretty much guaranteed atmosphere. That's that's a certain. But then when you get a match like that, it just sends <laughs> it to a different level. It, it, it's um, it, it's yeah, it's incredible. Right. Um, Alex, did you have a question for Marco? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Marco, it's nice to chat with you. And I, I'd love to know what you saw as far as what changed for Inter in the second half. Was it strictly grit and mentality or was there anything tactical? I mean, how, how was the game? How did the game manage to shift like it did in that second frame? Um, I think once they got that goal, I think Brozovic, you know, turned the, the match around, obviously. It was such a great goal, such an important time as well. And, you know, he knew that the support was there. You know, you had 70 or maybe maybe not that many. There was a quite a large you know, Milan contingency as well. Um, the, the match was won on heart and character. Like, tactically, I don't even... Conte said in the post-match interview, he said there wasn't really much that I could have told. You know, they, they knew what they had to do. They knew they hadn't been doing it in the first half. But, um, but apart from that, it was just they, uh, they needed the, the confidence and the motivation. And as soon as Brozovic got that goal and the crowd erupted and and basically into just um you know remind rem, remembered how to play football and how much of a, a quality side they are and and that they were actually going for the top spot in the league mike well i mean i've got to say obviously there's you know no, sorry um like ibrahimovic he was a big factor in the first half he, mm. he, he was yeah, amazing he, yeah unbelievable yeah, and his athletic ability, so uh, you know, once, he's, he's once so got, strong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Once that got a little bit put aside, and uh, you know, I think into concentrated on their game, they they managed to to get that one-two knockout punch, basically that um, swept Milan aside. And uh, Mike, did you have a question for Marco? Yeah, Marco. Um, I was a little bit surprised to see Ericsson not starting this game. Um, I was wondering where do you see Inter going from here uh, in terms of their starting midfield lineup, especially with uh, with no Sensi, like you know, didn't play yesterday. But where do you think you know, do you think Ericsson will get a starting spot, or what? You, are you can use rotation. How do you think that plays out uh, going forward, especially because I, I thought he played pretty well in the minutes he played yesterday. Yeah, yeah, he did. Um, he you know for the for the short amount of time that he. He was on the pitch. It definitely, um, you could tell that he was 
a quality player and he had a lot to contribute. And I'm sure that he will in time. I think maybe Antonio Conte didn't really want to mess with the system that two, uh, two front players um, probably wouldn't have been the same with, um, with uh, Ericsson starting. Um, I, I think uh, it was more of just they didn't want to risk uh, changing things that uh, Inter had worked hard on throughout the rest of the season on. So that, you know, the, the formation that he had and with Brozovic back to his form and Vecino also having a fantastic game, I think it prob- Ericsson may have been, felt that he'd had to participate a little bit more in the midfield and maybe take a bit of the shine away from the other three with Bradella included. So... And maybe wasn't just ready to be a, a second striker as, as much as uh, Sanchez was. Plus, I think psychologically, it would have been a pretty big blow for Sanchez. You know, the moment that uh, Lautaro is uh, suspended, not to give somebody of his caliber an opportunity in such an important game, um, really wouldn't have been a very good uh, mark of confidence for Alexis Sanchez. So I think in the end, there was a few contributing factors, but um, you can't really say that he got it wrong. Sanchez uh, definitely helped in getting into back on track. Fulvione, have you got a question for Marco? Of course. Um, Marco, uh, we witness a madness derby and uh, for this reason I'm interested in your opinion about the psychological part of this game. Because uh, my impression was that uh, AC Milan practically play very well and with confidence when uh, the game uh, went uh, exactly according to what they prepared. But when the game uh, starts um, going into a different direction, uh, I had the impression that AC Milan start to uh, be afraid about uh, uh, deal with uh, uh, a victory. Um, so my question is, uh, uh, we, we, we recognize and we acknowledge uh, uh, the mentality of Inter to come back into this game, but uh, uh, when do these uh, credits for Inter begin and uh, when do this struggle for AC Milan finishes? Or in other words, uh, is, was that possible uh, uh, to, to achieve this, uh, this victory if uh, AC Milan play exactly like the first half? Uh, well, let me start by saying that um, Milan had a plan and it worked to perfection in the first half. Now, maybe physically, deep down, they, uh, you know, we, we kind of figured that it was never going to be uh, a plan that they could have taken into the second half, um, you know, as, uh, as, as well as they did in the first. Um, but um, when... You're, you're lacking a leader, like really somebody who can recognize that, you know, um, that there's a bit of a, a shift in momentum and, you know, rallies the troops and says, okay, guys, let's calm things down. You know, we had a great first half. Let's try and uh, get it back to where we were. Um, I, I, rec- I thought that there wasn't any real leadership role out there for Milan to, to try and calm things. I think everybody just looked at each other and said, well, what's going on? And and no one really stepped up. So, you know, it was difficult for them to then get back into that groove, I think, also because into, you know, we're just too, um, too strong. Too many times in the first half, Inter would lose the ball cheaply. There were too many short passes and, you know, not enough uh, aggression. And Milan were all over them. They, they were the ones winning the 50-50 balls. They were the ones getting players into the attacking half at will. I don't think, you know, Inter spent very little time in uh, the Milan opposition in the first half, thanks to, you know, some good setup play as well um, by the, the Milan uh, players. But uh, ultimately, they weren't able to continue in the second half and there was no one there to try and, and force them into, you know, um, to re- refining that, uh, that confidence that they had in the first half. Maybe... Ibrahimovic, you know, that, that post at the end uh, could have changed things, obviously. Um, but uh, I, I don't think at that point, really, Milan deserved to, to take away a point. And, and that's uh, what it proved to be. Mm. Mo, did you have a question for Marco? Yeah, um, I'll have a quick one. Uh, Marco, um, who do you reckon, uh, I mean... No, not uh, talking about Inter now that uh, segueing off of uh, Fulvio. 
Who do you reckon that Milan can build a team around yesterday? I mean, certainly not a 30, 38 year old Ibrahimovic, who was their stand up player. Do you, see, do you see a real core emerging under Pioli, or will they have to completely restart their project next uh, summer? Um, to be honest, I can't see anybody that they'd uh, really want to build their team around. I think they're going to have to start selling and, um, and just trying to get you know, some kind of a, a plan. It doesn't look like they have a plan at the moment. I don't think, you know, you, that losing Suzo is, and not replacing him with anybody, that's a sign that, you know, we're not, we're not really sure what we're doing here. <laughs> I, I get, I, I'm, I take that away from, from the, the winter transfer window of Milan. I think they've invested too heavily on Ibrahimovic, who obviously is going to make a difference. But I think he's, you know, they've, they've put too much on him, too much pressure on him and too much expectation on him to, to try and change Milan's season around. I honestly thought I was expecting better from Chalanoglu last night. I saw him in the match uh, that he played, I think, in the cup. Um, and he was impressive. You know, they... They, they seem to have a lot more confidence when he is on form. And, but um, Ben Esser last night was disappointing. Uh, Romagnoli, you know, obviously, you expect a lot better than, from him uh, being a, an Italian national team player. But uh, for Milan, he hasn't impressed. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I don't know how Milan are going to get themselves out of this, uh, this slump. Um, you know. We'll see how they go in the cup on uh, on Wednesday night. Mm, that's that's a good point. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. No, I, I I think one thing that I um, wanted to uh, talk about, uh, I wanted to like basically let, you know ask everyone what you thought was 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 basically for me. Um, I thought that Inter were defending a little bit too deep. The balance in the team was a little bit too deep. And when you are, when you play that deeply and you have Ibrahimovic, I mean his strength for the past 10 years has been this ability to, to, to win the balls when, when, when teams defend deep, you know, get ball, you know, when you get him good service, he has this amazing ability to suck in the ball and kind of, you know, play it onwards and flick it uh, to, to, to other players. And I think especially the first goal is a great example of that. No matter how good a defender you are, he, he will win that, uh, that that's his strength. Um, but I felt that in the second half, what 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 Conte did was to lift the team about 10, 15 meters further up the pitch. And Ibrahimovic does not have the explosiveness and speed that he used to have before. So so I thought for me that was a tactical change as well from Conte, which I really liked. And for me, another aspect that that I wanted to, to hear what you guys thought about is is not just the fact that Milan dominated the first half and Inter dominated the second. What really got me was this ability that in the first half. Conte seemed completely unable to change anything around in the first half. But when in the second half he did change it around, Pioli looked completely unable to respond as well, which, which I found a bit strange because I, I thought I've always thought that both you know Italian coaches are, have always been good at kind of coaching in game, but they both seemed completely unable to. I don't know if you agree with that. Uh, Mo? Did you? What, what do you th- what are your thoughts? Look, uh, I. I... I, I I agree to a degree, but I also, I, I thought, you know, everyone's talking about uh, Conte promised that he would, uh, you know, uh, put the Pazza Inter behind him and the, it's the new era of non-Pazza Inter and whatever. And yesterday, it's the most Pazza Inter performance. I don't think it was a very, uh, I, I don't think, as a matter of fact, I think it was a, quite a mature performance. I think uh, building on what we said about the Udinese game last week, uh, it was a, a side that, you know, of course, the two goals that were let in were a mistake, but it was a side that managed the entire 90 minutes in terms of physical output much, much better. Milan went in very frantic. They approached the game very immaturely. There was an adrenaline dump. And uh, like Marco had said earlier, it was a pace that they could not know. Everyone knew they could not set. And like you rightly said as well about Ibrahimovic, you know, it, it's, not, it's not that Conte forced the team to push forward 10, 15 yards. It's just that Milan weren't putting in the pressure and allowed Inter to be able to express themselves a little bit more offensively and push forward. It was a combination of both. So back to, so I think the first half, while again, like we said earlier about the Udinese game last week, I, I don't think Conte has gone out and instructed the players 
to concede two goals or to perform at 60% <laughs> intentionally, you know. <laughs> no, but I, I think, uh, I, I think it, it is a mature way to manage a match when you look at it as a full 90-minute sort of affair rather than I want to do uh, my utmost at every point in the match and then I've blow, blown my muscles out by the 60th minute and can't perform. Uh, so, so I think... That, that, that is the Conte angle, in my opinion. I mean, maybe, uh, maybe I'm reading too much into this uh, or, or giving him too much credit, but I, I, I still think that it was a very mature performance from that perspective. As for Alan? Pioli, I mean, yeah. we know this. We, yeah. So, sorry, yeah, we, we, know the, we know this about Pioli. Uh, when, when, he, when, he, when he managed Inter, he, he's, he's quite good at setting a team up, but he's very bad at, at managing a match. And that's what happened when Inter went into that torrid run of form after he had uh, taken over from uh, De Boer, you know, a very bright start. And then people knew how to read his mat, read his uh, lineup. And so I, I think Pioli's, Pioli's shortcomings are, are in that department, in, in, in the in-game management of a match. But yeah, that's here. That's interesting. Um, Alex, you got any opinions on that? Uh, well, yeah, well, you know, early in the second half, uh, around the time of the Brozovic goal, when you started to see the energy go through the roof, I thought of Mo and I thought of the conversation that we had, you know, last week about conserving energy. And like he said, it's it's not as if uh, the the battle plan is to allow two goals and have a brilliant come from behind. But you, know, you certainly see a difference in the approach. Um, I, I thought that uh, the way that the the second half transpired, it certainly showed a strong mentality. I think the halftime break was very needed because. Uh, you know, it, it was certainly deflating to uh, to give up two goals in the first half, especially and, and Inter were completely outplayed, of course. But you know, the the goalkeeping was atrocious from Padelli, which only even kind of uh, lowered my morale even further. But even a- after that first goal, after the Rebic goal, I I thought that the for a few minutes, I thought the body language started to look pretty atrocious from the team, and I thought, man, are we going to start to see almost like a remix of Inter in January happening in February? Is this the start of a of a terrible tailspin. So uh, I was very pleased to see the way that they performed late. And, you know, also uh, how much were we talking uh, before the January transfer window, especially when the club was, you know, suffering a lot of injuries in the midfield about how nice it would be to have more squad depth. I mean, the ability around the 60th minute to bring on someone like Christian Eriksen, who I thought was very good. And his free kick was almost one of the most exquisite goals we've seen all year. Uh, It was just, uh, it, it was great uh, and very, very proud to be a supporter of this club on this day because how many times over the years have we seen performances where the first half yesterday would have been the way things looked for 90 minutes and then we're having this awful come-to-Jesus conversation today and we're giving each other group therapy. Like, How many times have we seen that over the years? So to have a conversation like the one we're having today is such such a welcomed bonus in our lives. Couldn't agree with you more. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the refereeing uh, because there there was a... I mean, I know that people can lose it on Twitter at times, but this was the first time where I, you know, I saw conspiracy theories that was really... That was really... That was especially on the on the so-called offside that never was because Conti's leg is plays uh, Alexis Sanchez uh, onside, and I want to hear hear a little bit from you there, Mike, because obviously being the only person who's worked as a referee, um, I I have a few questions to you there. First of all, first of all, the issue is that the, the obviously the people who the, the the video assistant referees they have more footage available to them than what is shown in TV to the to the audience, right? <laughs> From what I believe and that I've spoken to referees who work in VAR, yes, they've got, they've got it all. They've got multiple cameras, uh, everything to, at their disposal. Uh, and and they, they just have the resources that, that maybe once, once they make a decision, they can then pass that on to the official broadcaster and then that broadcaster can, can use whatever they're given from VAR. Uh, that's what I've been told. And it's just, it's not like, it's not like uh, they're choosing what to show for us so that's bias or anything. It's just that's what's available from the official broadcast, from, from the VAR team to the official broadcaster, and then they put it out there. And that's what happened, you know, a few minutes later. 
Yeah, and also we have to, uh, and, and also we should note that the referee, the, the the referee of the game, he's not allowed to uh, judge, adjudicate uh, offside situations in VAR. In the like that's that's the VAR's decision, right? Yeah. So like it's, I want to say this: it's it's an offside decision is presumably a black and white situation where it's not based on opinion, where it's you have you have either he's offside or he's not. Uh, and once that decision is made in that situation where they allowed the goal in the situation, they stop, they do their check while the VAR team is, review- VAR team is reviewing it. You know, whether it takes 30 seconds, a minute, minute 30, the team is looking at it. And then once they make a decision, they tell the referee and then that's it. It's not like the referee needs to go look at it. They're all looking at the same screen. Uh, it just, it's a very black and white situation offside. So it's, he's either not or he is. And, there's no need for him to go. So it's just going to create more delays if the referee's going to go look at it. So that's kind of why they do it. Exactly. Great. No, I just wanted to run that because I saw a lot of nonsense about people, you know, people taking screenshots off of their phones and saying, well, Luke, my opinion is this. And I'm thinking, well, they use millions of pounds and euros worth of technology and software. And I can guarantee you that they, you know, they, like they, they have more, they have access to better cameras. I mean, just because it's not shown on TV, it's not there, is it? Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's just the whole yeah. discussion. The discussion was so weird. You can't have an opinion on some something is either offside or it isn't. Now, I can understand that people feel that it's a bit dodgy when it comes to these offside, these millimeter offside decisions. Fair enough. But at the end of the day, I I do trust them with their technology more than my camera phone and my yeah, and, computer and the situ- <laughs> yeah the situation the situation here Nima, is that is that when they first showed the replay of the goal it since it's on an angle it actually does kind of look that alexis sanchez was offside when the ball came through and and my opinion at that point was wow this could be offside and the first replay i just i wasn't sure if they were going to allow or disallow it and then it wasn't until about 5 minutes later is when the var team kind of handed that that's kind of screenshot of both of when the ball was played and the screenshot of Alexis Sanchez on a, maybe a better angle. It still wasn't perfect in on the line, but it was a little bit of better an angle. And they passed that on to the broadcaster broadcaster show it. And that kind of gave us the idea. Okay. Well, Conti's leg was trailing while Sanchez was kind of moving forward. So although it doesn't look like he's on side uh, offside, he was. So I'm not, uh, that being said, I'm not 100%, you know, going to say that this is a, this is 100 on side i'm just saying from what i looked at it and what was provided it doesn't there was no clear and obvious error from the on side call on the field and there was just no way that they were going to overturn that and that's the reason why now had they called it offside and that goal had been given there's maybe a small possibility that they they overturn it in that situation but i just didn't think that there was any chance that they could have overturned that because there just wasn't a clear and obvious error that's that's a great explanation, I think. Uh, thanks for that, Mike. Um, right, um, uh, Marco, when you were at the stadium there yesterday, how, how did people react to all of that? Uh, to the offside? Uh, yeah. <laughs> or to, yeah, yeah um, no, I mean, was there a little bit of apprehension there? Because I was watching that and I was thinking, that's got to be offside. Uh, it, was, it was actually quite comical. Like, um, I was pretty fortunate from where I was sitting. Um, we, we basically were just behind the goal where all six goals were scored. So <laughs> we were enjoying every minute of it. But um, <laughs> the, the problem, the thing there was that uh, apparently the camera angles weren't even in a good position to show who scored the goal. So when they started yelling out Lukaku's name, I was adamant that it wasn't Lukaku that had scored that, that it was Vecino. And yet everybody's starting to yell Lukaku's <laughs> name. And it really confused me. And then I, I actually happened to listen to the um, a replay of the, the radio broadcast that Rai do from, you know, Tutto Calcio, Minuto per Minuto. And there was a, a journalist called Francesco Retice. And he, he got a few things wrong, I've got to say. But, I mean, he's still an amazing commentator. But uh, he's the one that said it was Lukaku. <laughs> and so they must have taken it from him. And so all of a sudden, everybody's yelling, yeah, Lukaku, Lukaku. No, yeah. He said, well, you know, I'm sure he'd like to score, but this one wasn't it. <laughs> but uh, as far I've got to say, um, listening to uh, Alex, your uh, your point of view on the um, on, on Michael, the Michael. line. Oh, sorry, Michael. Michael um, on the 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 linesman and the the VAR getting involved. Um, it, 
Yeah, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. If it had have uh, been signalled as uh, offside by the on-field linesman, then there's probably more chance that it would have kept that decision. I think FIFA have kind of given that directive recently and saying that, you know, we, you can't use VAR to, um, to, over, you know, to um, overturn a decision that's got so, you know, small um, margins of, of error. Like, there are, so it, there's a great margin of error, excuse me, just so, you know, so small distances. And you also use the word particularly uh, clear cut or black and white. It's, it's not absolutely because still there is a bit of human interaction when they do draw those lines. And, and, you know, I've seen so many of these bar reviews, like the image that they have to show after to show exactly why the bar took one decision or another. And, you know, that there's many different ways that you can draw those lines. <laughs> and, you know, the, the resolution of, of, the, of the images are never going to be uh, high enough to be able to tell that, you know, he's got a fingernail in an offside position or not. I mean, so it, I think they've just got to go with the on-field decision as much as they can and if there is evidence, clear evidence that, you know, that it was a, a wrong call, then, then overturn it. But anyway, from the, from the sideline, yeah, no, I didn't notice anything. We were just hoping that uh, <laughs> that was going to be a goal, to be honest, because everyone's just waiting there going, well, they've, they've already announced that, uh, you know, it's the, the VAR from an on-field point of view. I mean, you've probably discussed this many times on your, on your podcast. It has got that disadvantage that it just, you know, you either celebrate too early or, you know, you don't celebrate at all or it's already, you know, you don't, um, it's taken that kind of instinctive uh, celebration away from the match. But, um, oh, but hey, yeah. hey, you know, as long as the right decision gets made in the end, I think everybody's happy. Yeah, true. Mike, you had, uh, you had um, something uh, you wanted to add to that, uh, did you? Well, yeah. Just be, just before I get going, um, uh, just uh, uh, just something a little bit, a little bit, uh, I'd say not related to the game yesterday. But uh, just when I went into work this morning, uh, we do every uh, we do something called a top ten, and something has to uh, hook us from the day before or the weekend or whatever it may be. And uh, obviously, we have a you know we have a show that runs every day. It's it's called Sports Center. It runs an hour, and uh, our hook yesterday was. Uh, the own goal from the PSG game, which is uh, which was just a comedy of errors, and it was it went off. Uh, it looked like it was going to be out for a goal kick, and then it came back, and then they end up Leon ended up scoring on their own net, and then our top ten today is kind of like it's called from bad to worse, and we need to use ten examples from sports that are just you know starts bad and gets even worse as it goes on, and uh, and they need examples from uh, from sports, whether it be football, tennis. You know, hockey, b- basketball, whatever it may be, and the first thing I could even think of uh, was interrelated. Obviously, if you go back to two thousand and nine, this is going back obviously eleven years. Uh, Inter and Catania, and uh, who remembers when uh, it was? I think it was about the eightieth minute, and Esteban Cambiaso was coming off, and the, the score was one one, and Suli Montari comes onto the field. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, they show a nice camera of him. He's excited to get on the field. And he's, you know, he's pumped up. Uh, the play resumes, and 10 seconds later, he's committed a pretty reckless challenge, gets a yellow card within 10 seconds, and then Catania have a free kick from just outside the penalty area. And it's, you know, pre- pretty tense moments, you know, 10 minutes left, you know, dangerous free kick. Uh, they take the free kick. And sure enough, Sully Montari puts his hand up, hits his hand, gets a second yellow card, a red card, a penalty for Catania. They win the game on that penalty. And Sully Montari walks off the field, has two yellow cards, a red card within a minute and 30 seconds. So it was the perfect example from going from bad to worse. Everything just, just everything just collapsed within that moment that Sully Montari ran on the field. And then a minute and a half later, he was walking off and Catania had won the game. So that was just a little story I wanted to share. Uh, <laughs> I remember inter- that. My intraday. day. And that's, yeah, one of my, I... that's, what, that's one of my, you look back at it now as it's obviously hilarious, but it's one of the, my, the most, like for me, the most iconic inter moments over in my lifetime is one of the things that you remember the most, even though it wasn't a great moment in terms of they lost that game, but it's just hilarious of what happened. As he, as he goes in the field, and two minutes later, he comes off, and he's been sent off. So just wanted to share that before I get going today. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. No, I remember. Yeah, for Fulvio, go, go. Game against Chelsea, if I remember correctly. No, which one? Sorry? 
was uh, just before the Champions League game uh, against Chelsea. Yeah. So the second leg like, uh, of the um, of the round of uh, 16 into the yeah. Yeah. into the 2010 Champions League. I gotta be honest, and, and when we were when we were when we were coming up with names for uh, like Moji of the week and Maroc um, um, Ranocchia or uh, Frog of the week. We were actually contemplating Muntari of the week because of that, because that is the most like I've I've got like it was so bizarre that we I didn't even get angry. I remember this so clearly. I remember Mourinho's face too. He was like, yeah, he, he was, was he was suspended, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, he was, yeah. He was suspended. Yeah, he was in the in the press box. Yeah, he was, and he looked he looked he wasn't even angry. He just looked with complete like, what are you doing, dude? <laughs> like it's just it was it's the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. Well, thanks for coming on, Michael. It was I know you got to run. So thanks a lot for coming on. And uh, oh, thanks a lot for explaining that VAR thing. Uh, and also also the, the offside thing and how it works. Marco, before we let you go, I just wanted to ask you a little bit. Um, who do you think, I mean, there's a lot of talk now about the, you know, the Scudetto, etc., etc. Who do you think will win the Scudetto? Can you give me your top six from one to six? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I tend to do really badly at these uh, forecasts and uh, predictions that you asked me to give on your podcast. I'm, I'm not, <laughs> I don't know. I don't really want to be uh, forced oh. into a corner and give a, a top six. Oh, every every um, one of your colleagues has done it. Patrick Kendrick's done it. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. yeah. Pickering's done it. Everyone's done it. So you've got to do it too. <laughs> okay. Okay. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to say, because I'm on an Inter podcast, I'll say Inter number one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, Lazio number two and uh, Juventus number three. Ooh, that, that's that's okay, okay. So this is how this is how is, you're asking how it's going to finish at the end of yeah, May. This yeah, is yeah, the, okay, yeah. the order. Yeah. Um, Atalanta, Napoli, Roma. Mm. I think the three remaining. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there is. There you go. So, uh, do you see? So, do you think that Inter will win the the Coppa Italia as well, or do you? Who do you think will go? Who will go through all the way there? Um. Ooh, uh, good question. Um. Just, just to say, it's the only title in Italy that Ronaldo, Cristiano, and Ibra have never won. That's yeah. really. Wow. And Conte, and Conte, they haven't won it as a manager. As a player, he won it, but not as a manager. So that's. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, I'm sure they'd be happy to lift any silverware this year, Inter. I've got to say, I think uh, I, it, it's incredible that they've gone this far, that they actually are fighting. It's a three-horse race. It's such an incredible league this season. Everybody is just ma uh, watering, the mouth watering, uh, you know, just thinking about what uh, the rest of the season has got in store. But um, I expect that all of these big signings that Inter are getting and the fact that Conte is, you know, on the man the the president's back and, and making sure that um, he gets what he wants. I mean, if, if next season, this season they can be forgiven for coming away without anything, but um, next season the, the, there's no excuses. They have to win something. And I think, you know, if, if it does come to a final obviously if they go to Rome then there's, there's no question they want to try and win especially if it is against Juventus or Milan um it would make it even more special to to lift the Coppa Italia and and I think you know you can never really count Inter out of the um the Europa League either when you think about um the big uh, advantage of winning Europa League is that uh, you're top seed in the um in the Champions League draw next year which mm. You know, for a team like Inter that at the moment in third and the group that they had this year uh, or last, you know, sorry, this season, um, yeah, you can see why they'd probably want to make sure that they're uh, you know, in a higher place and just not mm -hmm. risk getting into, into a group of death in the Champions League. That's a great answer. Now, who's going to win the Coppa Italia? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Um, oh, oh, Come on. I'll, I'll give it to Inter. <laughs> and then to double. You heard it right here. Um, Marco Palmieri. And, and well, thanks a lot for coming on, Marco. If you if you got something you want to plug that's coming up, feel free. And if people want to follow you on Twitter, what do they do? What's your handle? Um, it's uh, Marco27, M-A-R-C-O-2-7. Um, yeah, always happy to hear from anybody that uh, is listening. Um, I am doing a cup game, I think. On yeah, I'm doing the Milan Juve game on uh, Wednesday night for the World Feed. So I don't know 
who will be picking that one up. But um, and then some other bits and pieces around the place. Um, yeah, you know, still uh, still enjoying it. Not doing as many big matches anymore. Not going to stadiums as much. Uh, commentating, <laughs> as do, but uh, I still love bringing you know even the smaller games to the world. So uh, if you do happen to catch me on air, yeah, send me a message and I'll say hi. Thanks, Marco. Thank you so much for coming on. Cheers, Nima. All the best. Ciao. Take it easy. Right. Um, Mar- uh, Fulvio, I'm, I want to hear, uh, and also you, um, um, uh, uh, Mo, I want to hear a little bit about, if we're talking a little bit about tactics, uh, Fulvio, wh- wh- what, are you, wh- what is your take on this? Because you, uh, the question you asked earlier was how much of this was Inter's being good and how much was I- Milan's weakness. What's your opinion on that? Personally, I think it was an issue of balance. The, Col- the Conte had the team 10, 10 meters too deep. And it changed that in the second half, and then just completely blew blew Milan out of the water. Well, what's your thoughts? Uh, yeah, well, uh, practically the same. I I thought it was an issue of balance as well, and uh, I checked the average position of Inter during the the half time, and I noticed that um, that Barella and Vecino during the first time in their in their average position was practically like thirty meters uh, far from each other which uh, practically uh, just revealed that was uh, um, an issue, a uh, very big issue of, uh, of balance on that. Uh, but I think that the credits to this uh, should be given to Milan, um, to AC Milan, because uh, what uh, AC Milan did, uh, especially with Teo Hernandez uh, on the left side, uh, was practically to, to, uh, to keep the, um, to keep the, the sides uh, um, very close to the um, very close to the midfield uh, and uh, very close to the center of the um, of the of the field, and uh, that's practically where we where, where we tilted into the game because uh, um, this uh, attitude of AC Milan makes practically both Candreva and Young uh, stay too, um, too uh, a little a little too much behind uh, their actual their actual position, right? Like sustaining and supporting the um, the defense, the the three the three men in, into the defense, but uh, that uh, practically creates uh, a great distance uh, between the um, the defense, which was five man defense at that point, and uh, the rest of the the rest of the team. In the second half, uh, I think that uh, uh, the the situation was completely changed um, because uh, it was uh, Inter that practically starts. Uh, to be balanced, uh, while AC Milan uh, wasn't uh, wasn't balanced uh, anymore, um, and um, I think that's um, I think that tactically speaking, uh, Inter won the game uh, when uh, Barella and Vecino start to play properly, um, and so that means supporting the the attacking uh, while uh, coming back into the defense uh, and play near Brozovic, and uh, this was um, this was a great struggle of the of the first half. Um, because um, if you notice, uh, that was uh, like uh, uh, Chalanoglu that was uh, practically defending and pressing and tackling uh, all the time uh, to, um, on, on Brozovic. But uh, Brozovic uh, did not have any solution uh, to, to pass the ball because Varela and Vecino was too far from him. While in the second half, uh, they started to be, to be close to him. And uh, being close uh, means that uh, Chalanoglu wasn't able to, to be on Brozovic all the time anymore. Um, so Brozovic came into, the, came into, the, into the, the style of play, practically came into the, into the, uh, the, the passing of the ball. And uh, that was one of the key. And another key was uh, the, um, the unsung, one of the unsung uh, players of Inter was, was actually young in the second half. But yeah, I think it was, uh, it was a very good performance from him. Because it was wise, it was wise to understand uh, when uh, when he needs to be close to the to the midfield and when he needs to be close to the defense, and that practically creates uh, create, um, uh, create, uh, uh, like uh, a number of um, a number of players for Inter that was uh, uh, that was above the um, uh, the number of players of uh, of AC Milan, and uh, this was a great game by Ashley Young in the second half, but also Candreva made this. Um, so yeah, practically, I I suppose that uh, finding the balance uh, to, to wrap up all this concept, I suppose that finding the balance for for Inter, um, it was a psychological effort, of course, uh, as we said, but was also uh, due to the um, to the to the change of the performance uh, uh, from Barella and uh, and Vecino, 
Uh, and so for me, the, the, the contribution of these two players in the second half was the key to the, um, to the match. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. I agree with every, everything you said there. Um, and that's pretty much how I, how I viewed it. I, the only thing I can add is that I found it really interesting that when Brozovic, because if you, like you said, in the first half, they, 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 they really, they really physically, they were really all over Brozovic in the first half. And he didn't move so much to the wings to pick up the ball. And when you completely neutralize him, then you neutralize Inter. But what I found was really interesting was that when they stepped up the balance of the team about five, ten meters further up, Brozovic not only got the got 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 was able to find space to distribute the balls, but I also found his movement really interesting. He started picking the ball up on the wings. He, at some points of the game, he was he was almost like a winger. I thought I thought the way he was creating games from the left side or the right side, um, and and it and I thought it would and I and personally I thought that Pioli would have had Milan uh, balanced in a way to kind of okay. So if your central midfielders and Chalanoglu don't get him, well, why doesn't Castillejo or or um, uh, Rebic uh, tried to try to pick him out. It was as if as soon as he went on a wing and tried to create and took the ball there and attacked down the flank. It was he was he was free to move, and I found that very strange. It was also it was also um, uh, a question. Um, it was also something that is related to intensity of the game because actually Inter start to to be vertical in the distribu- distributing of the ball and being fast. Um, mm. But uh, mm. one of the things that uh, I think uh, AC Milan struggled with uh, was the um, was the the fact that Inter start to play very wide, right? So if you see. Mm. Ash- Andreva play very wide, and when mm. in, in Conte's Inter start to play very wide, there's always a good chance that he's going to win the game because it's exactly our style of play: being wide and uh, cover the field uh, um, with the sides. And mm. that's missing this in the first half because, as I said, uh, the the two the two sides, Andreva Young was supporting the defense because the midfield is not, is not uh, the, the midfield was, uh, was missing practically. But when the sides start to be Start to play widely with the team. The team start to um, keep up, keep up with, uh, with the with with the right distances, right? And tactically, that that was a difference for me. Mm, agreed. Right. Um. I you guys are both kind of my age. We're all in the same age group. Um. I remember a derby that I've that has been bugging me for the past 15, 10, 15 years, where Inter were two nil up and lost four two. So yesterday for me that this was payback for that. Do you remember which one I'm talking about, Fulvio? Of course, but uh, I think that <laughs> it was three two, not four two. Oh, so, oh, I thought it was four two. Yeah, I, I, I just remember during the game, I was so annoyed and thinking, "Ha ha, you got back for that one." Um, yeah, I, yeah. Well, which game was that? Remember? Yeah, yeah, I remember that. I remember that, and uh, yeah, the, the, um, uh, there was a, a lot of analogies with this, with that derby, and one of this was that uh, AC Milano was uh, in the race for the scudetto. While uh, Inter was wasn't practically. That's the one. That's the one. Yeah. yeah. Was and was that when was this? Was it two thousand three or two thousand two? I can't remember. It was uh, it was February two thousand four. That's so all. exactly yeah. uh, sixteen years ago. Oh. And uh, yeah, and uh, we we were punished by Karen Sedov at the last uh, the last minute. Mm, yes. Uh, there was there was a lot of analogies actually. While there was another another derby that uh, we lost for two. It was in 2001, and uh, the first season of Cooper. Um, mm. And but uh, was the, the game was a bit different because uh, Inter take the lead. I, I think that Ventola is uh, scored uh, that time. But then uh, the comeback from AC Milan was uh, from uh, one nil and not from two nil. The second ah, okay. for Inter was uh, was uh, scored uh, was scored later in the game. Mm. Okay, yeah, that's true. It's just um, we, I am, um, <laughs> I just, I, I just thought of that a lot yesterday when when Inter got back to two two, and and then we, we, I was thinking, okay, the, um, this is payback for that. It's funny, uh, it's sixteen years, like I still can't let it go. <laughs> so so hopefully there will be payback for six nil sometime soon too, huh? <laughs> right. Um. I and 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 you know these these big games are really piling up because we have. Uh, on Wednesday, Coppa Italia, first leg of the semi-final Coppa Italia against Napoli at the San Siro, and then on the weekend, away against Lazio uh, in, uh, in, in at the Stadio Olimpico in Rome. 
I mean, these games, this is going to be, this is the toughest month I think Inter are going through pretty much in the entire season because there's so many games, Coppa Italia, Europa League and Serie A, and it's all against good good teams, except for, with all due respect to Ludo Goretz, um, I don't think uh, I, I don't I don't see them on the same level as as uh, as uh, as Napoli in the Coppa Italia or or Milan and and Lazio in the Serie A. But looking forward to those two games, um, what do you want to see going forward? Like, what is the approach you would like to see, Mo? I'd like to see a conservation of energy against Napoli, and then uh, I'd like to see us uh, finally. Uh, see off Lazio properly uh, in Rome. I think uh, Inter have become a boogie, uh, boogie team for uh, the Laziali, and uh, I can imagine no better way to rain on uh, uh, Simone Inzaghi's uh, parade uh, than by uh, putting them four points behind us uh, in the weekend. So I, I think as long as, uh, as long as, let's say, we don't concede any away goals against Napoli, uh, that 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 for me is the most important thing, and then we go and uh, focus on uh, Lazio, uh, making sure that uh, um, they're they're knocked. The, the wind is knocked out of their sails. What about you, Fulvio? What do you want to see go in those two games, uh, starting with the Napoli game? Well, uh, first thing first, uh, we need to understand that Coppa Italia must be our our main target this year. Um, so I'd like to see a game uh, uh, against Napoli in which uh, Inter tried to seal uh, the final uh, in the in the first leg, um, which is not it's not easy. But uh, I would like to see that kind of approach, right? Like uh, let's get a, a big advantage and then let's go to San Paolo and uh, try to and try to go away with the final. Uh, but uh, let's try to not uh, um, to not. Uh, Load that uh, that second leg with too much because uh, you know it's in Sao Paulo is always difficult. Um, mm. And uh, from the other from the other competition, uh, well, it, it's difficult, right? Uh, the Lazio game, uh, then we have Sampdoria, then we have Juventus uh, and Europa <sighs> League. The middle, uh, it's a lot. That, that, that's too much, man. I mean, uh, <laughs> I'm, I, 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 you're right. I think we all deserve a little break. Uh, it's going to be a mad February, and then going into March, like you said, it's Juve and, and Juve away, um, and, and that's that's going to be pretty much decisive. I mean, in my opinion, that's why I think Juventus is going to win the Serie A because I think they're going to at least draw Inter uh, at home and uh, and and go through, uh, and 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 therefore they're going to. They're always going to have that advantage of having beat Inter in the Serie A uh, away uh, against us. Right. Um, I th- before uh, Now it's time for the part of the show where we pay tribute, rip the piss out of and criticize someone or something heavily in the world of football. Uh, starting with the positivity, which will be presented by Mr. Positivity himself, Mystic Mo Nassar. He's, he works a lot, he's intelligent and... He surprised uh, people sometimes with his uh, ideas. Not easy to find one person of this uh, qualities. What a week, what a plethora of positivity to pick <laughs> from. Uh, no, really amazing, amazing. There's so, so much, so much great vibes. As usual, uh, Stephen Chang in the stadium celebrating like a madman with uh, Zanetti and, uh, uh, and the rest of the management is a lovely, lovely sight. Uh, I think uh, Ashley Young was his celebrations were were really really um, uh, genuine and from the heart and I, I was really keen on seeing what his social media would be would be writing about the game yesterday. You could really tell that uh, he, he really took to the to the Miazza and to the derby. But if if we're going to talk about a stand up standout. Uh, performance a standout player it has to be Stefan de Vrij. Uh, we've been uh, you know we've been tooting his horn here on the podcast mm. for what four or five weeks in a row now and to cap this amazing runoff with uh, the goal that turns it around the winning the, the the third goal an amazing goal an amazing second half performance uh, flawless as usual uh, despite a shaky start to the match uh, I mean uh, this guy, this guy is such a level-headed, cool, uh, cool character on the pitch, and I, I, and to think that we got him on a Bosman or on a free or whatever you want to refer <laughs> to the transfer, you know, from Lazio is is just amazing, amazing. So uh, he's my uh, 
He's my Murati of the week. And God talk about it being well deserved. I mean, we Fulvio, you, me, everyone. We, I mean, De Frey is. I mean, it's 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 Beckon. I mean, to me, he reminds me. He has an elegance in defense that I I remember in Nest time Beckenbauer. You know, watching old clips of Beckenbauer. He owns the defense, and he's like a libero as well. And his passing, I uh, know. De Frey is, is turning out to be the signing, the best signing Inter have made in a very long time. Almost like Cambiasso. Finally, Nima, finally, finally, in mid of February, Gazzetta dello Sport uh, today, in the, in the ratings of the derby, wrote, uh, probably we, uh, we, we, have, we have the suspect uh, that uh, this is the best defender of the Serie A. Well, welcome, Gazzetta dello Sport. <laughs> exactly. The rest of us have been watching this for the past six months, but, you know, better late than never, right? <laughs> Right, um, let's move on to something uh, much more negative. This week's Moji, which we presented by Mr. Fulvio Santucci. Well, nothing new today on this, uh, on this Moji, but uh, something that still needs to be keep up because uh, we tend to, especially in Italy, we tend to to forget this uh, this topic, but uh, we need to we need to understand that it's important. Uh, and I'm talking about referee. Um, so um, something happened during the the, the last two uh, two legs of Serie A. First, uh, the the mistake against uh, Fiorentina on the Juventus field. Uh, there was a huge uh, um, you know a huge speech by Comiso, who said that um, that referee needs to respect Fiorentina. And uh, that was a mistake, uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, yesterday, something similar happened in Parma, during Parma-Lazio. And uh, there was a clear penalty for Parma uh, in, the, in the injury time, and uh, it was denied. Um, so this is something that's happened all the time. Uh, but uh, I think it's not a matter that's who stole from who, because that's not a big picture. The big picture is the structure of the Referee Federation of Italy. And um, during this week, uh, we have, uh, uh, we have uh, um, a former referee, uh, which is called Boggi, not Moji, but Boggi with the B, um, <laughs> which, which basically hints uh, hint, uh, at, uh, at a dictatorship into the referee federation by the, the chairman of the president of the, of the referee federation, which is Nikki. And he said that uh, he's, um, he's a totalitarian. Um, he's a, he's a, 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 that's a dictatorship, uh, and uh, someone that's uh, that is against Nikki into the into the uh, into the into the federation is going to be is going to be sent away, um, and this is dangerous according to him. And uh, Nikki just uh, tried to sue him for this uh, for this declaration, um, but uh, I think that uh, we need to we need to have a look on that because. Uh, um, Especially, especially who needs to talk about this, and I'm talking about Italian media, is not pointing at the big picture. Especially, um, especially when uh, uh, Comiso, um, when Comiso talk about about uh, the, the referee mistake, he's American, he's from outside, he's not understanding what is going on. And uh, Gazzetta dello Sport uh, just wrote, uh, uh, Comiso is uh, one of the of the same men that uh, happens to to Serie football into into the last year, so always complaining, uh, uh. never took. Taking- Ability, something like that. But uh, once again, the big picture is here is that uh, the referee needs to be needs to support the game and not to be a part of the game. And that's important to understand because uh, when uh, the referee are a part of the game, uh, the game are not going uh, how they need to go. Right? The game should be the part of the game should be just the players, just the teams, and nothing nothing else, no one else. Uh, and uh, yes. We have also a lack of communication because uh, um, nobody nobody asked Nicky about the situation of the referee after Juventus Fiorentina, and nobody asked, asked Nicky about the referee federation after Lazio Parma. Yesterday, the, the Daversa, um, the Parma coach, uh, came to the um, to the TV and said something which uh, is very very heavy to to hear, which was uh, uh, the the referee did did not go to the off-field review because uh, if uh, he did. He should uh, give and uh, that penalty, and uh, mm. he, he, he did he did not want to, to, to give the penalty. So Oof. that this is a situation, and uh, I, I I repeat, is not is not anymore a matter of uh, who stole from who. It's no. a matter that we have a structural situation that needs to be solved as soon as possible, mm. 
because it's not supporting the game in the right way, like every other country, like every other federation. So once again, we need answers from the referees. We don't need to, we don't need to be um, we don't need to be uh, the, the guys that is going with, with the conspiracy, and we don't yeah. need that uh, that we are the we are the, the people who is uh, is not accepting uh, to be to be defeated uh, or to not be awarded uh, by the things that we want to be awarded. We need answers. We need communication from the referee. And uh, hold the episode that is happening uh, into this uh, into this uh, this season uh, with uh, VAR or not with VAR going in this direction. So once again, referees, you are my mojo of the week. Mm. Um, that's uh, I couldn't agree with you more. And I'm glad that you said that it's not about a conspiracy; it's a structural error. Or to quote Cio Rocco Comiso, uh, "Tutto il mondo sta guardando queste porcherie." Okay. <laughs> I absolutely love that man. Um, uh, you're right. No, I couldn't agree with you more. I, and I and I and I think your your analysis is spot on. There is there is a discrepancy in in terms of clarity, and that is the problem. Um, and the clarity and the consistency. And it's not about being conspiratorial, uh, like you said. So, uh, th- thanks for that explanation. Great one, um, uh, Fulvio. Right, let's move on to something much more uh, something much more comical. This week's frog, which I'll be presenting myself. For those of you who are on Twitter, you know that there's a there's a parody account uh, who someone's created a parody account uh, of where he's me, where he's mer- created a parody account where he's f- made a fusion or fused together two characters, uh, Donald Trump, the U.S. president, and uh, and uh, Andre Agnelli, the the Juventus president, and his name is Donald J. Agnelli, real Don Agnelli. He tweeted out this past week a funny tweet. Um, uh, and it goes like this, uh, Calciopoli was evil, very vicious and evil, it was dirty cops, Juventus did nothing wrong, Luciano Moji, an innocent man and family man, was banned for making a perfect phone call, and Juventus was nearly destroyed. It should never happen again. Uh, David Amoyal, a good friend of the show, responded in a comical manner, congratulations on your absolution from the phony charges. Now everybody knows that Moji was, was, not, was convicted and he lost every appeal since. Now the funny thing is that the real Luciano Moji this this was lost on him because he saw these two tweets and he liked them, thinking they were serious, uh, which says everything you need to know about the lack of self-awareness that that man has, which is incredibly comical. So for that, Luciano Moji is this week's frog. Right, uh, that's all we had time for this week. Uh, I'd like to thank Mike, uh, Alex, and Marco for coming on. I'd like to thank you, Fulvio. It's always good to have you on. Thank you. Thank you, Nima. Thank you, everyone. And uh, I'm, going, I'm coming back very soon. Can't wait to have you. And as always, Mystic Mo, Mystic Positivity, Mr. Positivity. Thanks for coming hey, hey, on. Hey. Always a pleasure. Looking forward to next week. Oh, me too. And uh, until next week, I'm your host, Nima Tavali Rutsari, wishing you a good week, a semi final win, three points, and sempre e solo Forza Inter. <laughs> Let's